you can see that in complexity, we have a very different relationship between causes and effects. It's kind of hard to, to draw it, but um, basically a complex system is a bounded system, right? So there's boundaries between this system and something else. And within the complex system, there's a set of uh, causes, there's stuff going on, and you can often see that it's often organized around particular attractors, right? There's maybe a shared purpose or there's something going on in there. Um, but what happens is that the effect, the visible effect of the system is a result of the causes all interacting in a way that produces something that is literally bigger than the sum of its parts. And this is what we refer to as emergence. And this is the dynamic that distinguishes complexity from all of the other domains is that, of course, in chaos, the you know, emergence is arising and decaying all the time. But in complexity, emergence can arise and become very stable. joining us from very close to Vancouver, so just a couple islands away, living on Bowen Island. And I've had the chance to exchange a few times with you, Chris, and it's been a pleasure. You were highly recommended to us by Mark McCurgo, because we were looking at systems thinking, how are we, um, all the influence of solution focus on complexity and how the challenges that we have in organizations and the recommendation to look into the Kinevin framework a little deeper. Uh, came up and we found Chris here, who's been working with David uh, Snowden as well, who's had a chance, I think you even wrote an article or a piece in his collection after publishing the Kinevin Framework 20 years, 21 years ago, you've prepared like a book for him, no? And in all the conversations I've had with Chris, I have to say it felt a little bit like being Alice in Wonderland. Um, it feels sometimes like my curiosity is fully awake and I feel that... Um, the questions, there are more questions coming up than answers in a way. And sometimes feeling very small, like the system is huge and we open up a big, big world. And the next minute we're looking at the details and uh, looking forward to experimenting and experiencing this with you, Chris. So I'll pass the host over to you. Yeah, good morning. My name is Chris Corgan. I live on an island that the traditional and old name of the island is Nuchlelechum. That's what you see in my uh, in my profile down here, I uh, mean, it's uh, Bowen Island near Vancouver, British Columbia, where it is just gone eight o'clock in the morning. So good to be with you here today. Um, and uh, hi to Mark, if he's watching on the video, uh, just to say thanks for the recommendation. Mark and I have known each other for quite a while. And uh, and Mark is really my, my connection in with the solutions focused community. So um, there's a few familiar faces on here today, but I don't know a whole lot about the solutions focused community other than these great conversations I've had with Mark over the years. So it'd been really nice to sort of cinch together all of these bits and pieces of what we know and what we're exploring and how things can be useful across different domains. Most of my work is in the field and in the world of doing participatory facilitation and leadership. And that's very highly complexity focused. Um, and so I've worked over the years with people like Dave Snowden, whose work I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, uh, as a way of kind of informing the choices I make around the kinds of methods and the kinds of interventions that I take on with um, groups of people that I'm working with. Um, and uh, very much like uh, Victoria, I think I span many different communities of practice, as probably many of you do as well. So I'm a steward of the Art of Hosting community globally and have been for about 15 years. Um, and that's focusing on large you know, large group self-organizing participatory uh, processes and methods and approaches to organization and community development. And I've also published in uh, textbooks around dialogic organizational development, um, as well as, as Annie said, the Kinevin, the Kinevin book that came out this year, Kinevin at 21, which is a really great book. Um, the practitioner community wrote this book for Dave because Dave never has time to write the book everybody wants to read. And so we we did it as a surprise birthday present for the framework. And so it's a, amazing. It's it's uh, several dozen articles about Kinevin. They're very, they're very bite-sized. I love that little picture of Dave. That's Dave there, leaning on one of the domains. Um, but highly recommend this. You can get that from the Cognitive Edge 
website as well. So just if you want to go deeper into the Kinevin framework and multiple ways of, of applying it and the implications of this work, that's a good place to go. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to go through this, this morning, afternoon, evening, night, <laughs> people in Malaysia who are, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to go through a couple of things. I'm going to uh, introduce you to the framework, but I'm going to introduce it through a tool that I often use with organizations to just, you know, begin to contextualize some of our issues and problems. And then we'll go through the tool um, and I'll explain it a little bit and um, kind of ground it, I think, in, in just some of the flavor of complexity that uh, informs this tool. Um, this comes out of the world that uh, a body of work that Dave Snowden has called anthro complexity, which is the complexity of human systems. And those of you that have been around for you know the last 20 or 30 years and definitely interested in the field will have traced kind of the evolution of complexity into human systems. And for many of us who work with organizations and communities, we might have come into the complexity world through systems thinking, um, through that kind of stuff that you know started appearing in the 1980s either through the application of chaos theory uh, and stuff from physics and math and biology into human systems or stuff more from uh, the engineering side of cybernetics and, and systems theory into the, the organizational world. And there was in the 1980s, I think, a beginning of a big mashup of trying to understand human systems as nonlinear, uh, unpredictable, fundamentally complex, and a search around looking in the world of natural sciences for what are the uh, ways we can begin to understand this? Um, and so a number of different approaches began to emerge in the 1990s. And one of those um, began, uh, uh, you know, one of those branches um, was one that Dave was involved in. And it had to, a lot to do with how we make sense of the world through narrative, through story, um, and, 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 and how we as human beings um, create meaning out of our experiences. And so that, um, I'm not sure when Dave started using the term anthro complexity. It wasn't too long ago, but it was a way of delineating this flavor, uh, this particular body of work of complexity um, and differentiating it from other forms. Now that's not necessarily important at the level at which I'm gonna be introducing things, but those of you that are interested in this field and wanting to know where it's positioned, there's, you know, there are there, there is a map, a famous map that goes around of all the streams of complexity science, and you'll find anthro complexity nestled in there. But a big feature of it is that it's it it understands that human beings act around meaning and identity, and that we very much construct um, our worlds out of the stories that we tell about what's going on. And so that then becomes the basis for a lot of the tools that we use for understanding um, the systems that we're working in and, and, and the conditions of our life that we're trying to shift and change. So, welcome. Um, I think before, so as we begin, I'm gonna share my screen here and I'm gonna introduce you to uh, the framework, but we're gonna do it through an exercise. So if you get a pen and paper handy, that would be good. Um, you can have something that you can write on if you prefer to write on your phone or um, you know, try not to write on the device that you're actually watching this on. Um, but here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to think of a situation where you're stuck. Okay, this could be in your work, in your life, with a client, um, in any, any place where you're just stuck. You're just trying to address something, hasn't been able to change. And just write it down as a short sentence. Please don't overthink it. <laughs> this is one of the things that stops us actually from working in complexity. Getting along with our neighbors around dogs. Good one. Executive director, board chair, wrapped in a codependent relationship. A couple of you writing books. Uh, climate crisis, okay. Finishing a thesis, which is also like writing a book except for an audience of three, right? <laughs> Same thing. Acquiring new clients. Not being able to travel. Getting going on pottery. Great. Nice. Okay, you can and you can cruise through that uh, the chat there as well, and you can start to see like this myriad of issues that we deal with in our life, and some of those can seem really small to you, and others are just absolutely debilitating. You know, uh, even avoiding making phone calls can be a completely debilitating uh, issue. So, with your situation, the next thing I'd like you to do is um, just identify five observable aspects of the situation. So, I just want you to write down 
If you were describing this situation to a friend, just five things that are contributing to it. That's all. Don't try and come up with the smartest ones. Make a list, at least five. You can make a longer list. Um, just short, simple sentences, tangible or intangible, big or small, any five will do. When we're doing this work in complexity, you can imagine all we, if we're working with a team on a stuck situation, just getting a list of, of five things. It doesn't take very long, and I always want to be working on a, a fairly tight constraint. We're not doing a massive analysis of the situation. It's what's most obvious. What comes up to you right away? What 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 are the five things that are contributing to this situation right now? Because the ones that are top of mind are the ones that are going to be most meaningful. And uh, if we're doing this with a team, it's very helpful to start comparing lists at this point and see what's similar, what's different. What are people all identifying together? Or what is the myriad of, of, of uh, possibilities and diversity that's around the table? Okay, so then the last thing I'd like you to do is with your list, I'd like you to code it. And I'd like you to use this criteria for coding it. Okay, so you just take a number. And if it's, I'm going to read these out to you before you, you, you go through coding them. So if this, the cause on your list, the thing that you see there, contributing to the situation. If it's something that's obvious, it's obvious what to do, and anybody could do it, right? You could ask anyone to do it for you. Anyone should be able to know with very minimal training. You show them once and they can learn how to do it. Then give it a number one, okay? If it's just obvious how what to do, all right? Um, if, it's an, if it's something that you need to hire an expert for, you need to bring them in somehow, whether it's just consulting with them, but there's somebody else who has the answer, but I don't have the answer. Um, I'm, I don't know how to do that thing, but I know somebody else does, so I'm just gonna get them to, to do it for me, or I'm gonna get them to teach me how to do it, then that's a number two. Okay, this is definitely definitely solvable, and uh, but I'm not the one who can do it right now. So that would be a number two. If it's neither of those two things, Think about whether it's the kind of situation where there is probably some evidence that suggests that there are lots of different ways of doing this, all of them good, um, but it's impossible to know if you're going to do the very best thing. Like you just can't tell getting started if this is going to be the best way to work. So that would be a number three. And then uh, a number four is if everything is just random or chaotic or a crisis and you just don't, you know, don't know what to do. In fact, you may be feeling panicky about that particular factor that's contributing to your situation, you can make that a four, okay? And again, to the best of your ability, take your best guess. Finally, if you want to, you can start sketching. This is the Kinevin framework. This is what it looks like. And this is where your statements belong in relation to the material I'm gonna be sharing with you here. So you can sort your list into those four spaces. You can, uh, uh, often when we're doing this with teams, I get people to write each of those contribute contributing factors onto a post-it note, and then we just we put them on a framework like this, um, or we cluster them according to the ones, twos, and threes, and then we begin to cluster them within. Um, but this is um, the exercise I've just taken you through is what we call a Kinevin contextualization exercise. And the reason for that is because the framework itself is actually something that that is most helpful if we can um, create it according to the context we're working in. Because it turns out that not everything you experience as a crisis, everybody else will experience as a crisis. But in this moment, it's important that you associate it as a crisis. There's a phenomenological aspect to the Kinevin framework. Um, and so every time we use it, I don't introduce it. When I'm introducing it to people in a strategic context, I, I don't often introduce it as a, here's the framework, let's sort things into this, but rather let's gather data about the situation and then sort it according to these criteria. So applying some constraints to the data set that we've got and seeing how this, how this works out. Because this begins to give us a clue about how we can address these various um, issues, these various parts of a problem. Kinevin fundamentally is a decision-making framework. It helps us to make decisions about the kinds of interventions we take in, in systems and in problems. And we do that from a perspective of looking for uh, data, a data set that's quite fine-grained and helps us to see patterns that are visible in the system. Uh, and especially it's true when we're working in complexity that the patterns in the system 
are, are, are the way in which complexity manifests itself. And so uh, one of the sayings that I like to use when I'm working in complexity is that I'm not trying to solve problems, I'm trying to shift patterns. And I'll come back to that in a moment. You'll notice that just this framework, I just want to show the basic shape to you. I want, to, I want you to be really clear about this basic shape. First of all, although there are four domains here that I've numbered, there are actually five domains in the framework. Uh, there's this one in the middle is actually really important. So there's five domains. Um, and when we begin this exercise, typically we'll put all the post-it notes in the middle and then we'll move them out to the four different domains. And there may be some left in the middle. I just don't know where they go. And that makes sense. And I'll explain why in a moment. The other thing I want you to notice about the Kinevin framework is that, so it's a five domain framework. And it also, these lines are wavy. Um, and they're not, it's, it's not a two by two matrix where each of the lines has the same function. The boundaries actually exhibit quite different functions in Kinevin, and I'll show you uh, that in a moment. But just if you're drawing this, which I love Dave. Dave says, you know, Kinevin works because it passes the back of a napkin test. You know, if you can draw it on the back of a napkin, it's the kind of thing you can just introduce anywhere. And I, that's one of the things I really love about it is you can introduce it at all kinds of levels of simplicity or complexity. Um, but it does have wavy lines. So if you ever do draw it, Make sure that there's a space in the middle and make sure that the lines and boundaries you're drawing are wavy, okay? Because they move uh, and they move based on the context of where you're working. Okay, so far so good. You're all, you're all looking at me like this is working still. Okay, so ordered and unordered. So, so the, here's where the Kinevin framework comes from. Basically, if we begin sort of at the beginning, uh, this seems obvious to say, but the world on this archetypal level gets divided into ordered and unordered spaces. So ordered spaces, ordered problems, ordered issues are knowable, predictable, and repeatable. So in other words, we can study a problem, we can learn what it's all about, we can predict what our intervention is going to be, we can, we can do something and it will be, it will work, we can test and see if it's worked and it's repeatable. And typically with these kinds of problems and also the kinds of solutions we bring to these problems, the cause and the effect is quite clear. Do this, get this, right? And the simpler it is, the more ordered the system is, the more repeatable that should be. Um, and so that's one class of problems in the world. And you know, most of the places I work, most of the places you work as well, people love those things because solvable problems, you know, are objectively uh, measurable and you can correlate them to pay scales and so on and so forth. And so people really like problems they can solve and take care of and knock off their, their to-do lists. And the other side, if you think about this as a range of, you know, the ways in which the world manifests itself are what's called unordered. And this is almost like the complete opposite of ordered. So these problems are fundamentally unknowable. In other words, you can't map the entire system, right? So you're going to always leave things out. So as we're going through the five characteristics of your own stuck problem, you know, if we had sat there trying to map your entire stuck problem, it would have taken us as long as it's taken you to create the problem or to live in it, right? Because the only accurate map of a human system is the human system. So anytime we're representing or trying to understand something, we're always going to be leaving stuff out. It's fundamentally unknowable in totality, although we can get a picture of it. The other thing about unordered systems is that, um, and especially the more to the unordered side we go, the more unpredictable our interventions are. So we're just not sure if this is going to work. And we can't say with certain that this intervention is going to work. So we have to try things and look at them and stay on top of them and, you know, gather information about them as we go. And the other thing is that quite often, because context plays such an important part in things, it's helpful to assume that what we're doing in the unordered world is actually unrepeatable. In other words, we almost need to come up with novel uh, solutions and ways of dealing with things every time we address an unordered problem and not to necessarily assume that what's worked in the past will work in the future. This, is, uh, this can be an error in thinking that can get us into a lot of trouble. Dave calls it retrospective coherence when we believe that the future performances can be based on our past results. Uh, you can create some real tunnel vision for yourself if you're doing that. So it helps to helps to understand that um, things that we might do in the unordered world are, are often unrepeatable. And that we can know cause and effect. There is a cause and effect underneath all of this somewhere. But in the unordered world, we can only know it 
ret retroactively, retrospectively. So it's the kind of thing, you know, like, oh, if only we, we knew then what we know now kind of situation, right? We've all been there, right? And so that's, you know, oh, I, we should have seen this coming. Yeah, well, you couldn't have, so like, because that's why you're here. If you'd seen it coming, you would have gotten out of the way. Um, so cause and effect are knowable, but only retroactively. And again, that creates the situation where we assume that if we assume that what's happened in the past will continue into the future, we can often get ourselves into tricky situations. Um, and as human beings, we do that because that's the way our brain works. We look for patterns and we try and preserve our cognitive load. And in so doing, we create um, heuristics and ways of thinking that take us into like, oh, yeah, I've been in this situation before. This is all we have to do. And how many of you have been in a situation like that and that's come back to bite you on the ass? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I have, maybe it's just me. A few of you are smiling like you have this knowing, yeah, okay, good, thank you. It's nice not to be alone. All right, so that's the basic way in which the Kinevan framework um, kind of opens itself up. And so what you'll find is that the domains that live primarily on the uh, right-hand side of the framework are, are the ordered domains, and the domains that live on the left-hand side of the framework are the unordered domains. And the domain in the middle we call confusion. Okay, so in other words, the one in the middle represents situations where we don't know what they are, and so typically we'll address them based on what we think they are. And that can be very confusing. In fact, I sometimes do an exercise with people where I ask them to organize themselves economically get into a room, put people in a big circle and say, okay, organize yourselves economically. And type in the chat what you think that means. If I say, organize yourselves economically, what would be the criteria for organizing yourselves? Yeah, by the sum in your bank account. That's a good one. As little energy as possible. The, use the least amount of space. Class, of course it depends. How much economics you studied. Yeah, so many options. By GDP of country, how much? Okay, so you can already see that there are situations that are confusing, right? These aren't necessarily like ordered or unordered at this moment. They're just confusing. And if we, if I say order yourself economically, and then the leader in the organization says, great, that means how many of you have studied economics? You're going to move over here and everyone else is thinking, wait, doesn't it just mean as quickly as possible? Um, you can create all kinds of confusion. And so we name this one confusion. Confusion is a very important domain in the Kinevan framework. I think it's the most important domain because if we assume that we know about everything about everything, we can get ourselves into some tricky situations. So when I'm doing this contextualization exercise, everything goes into the middle. As we sort things into the different domains, whatever is left in the middle, we should have a conversation about what it is before we start, sort it out. And there could be aspects of it that belong in different domains. So confusion is really important. Acting when we're confused is dangerous, right? Um, acting when we assume that everybody has the same information or the same belief as we do is, is, uh, is dangerous. And so I really want to uh, privilege this one a little bit. Um, I have a, a blog post, actually, I'll send you the link where I talk a lot about this. And over the last couple of years, if you follow Dave's work, you'll see that a lot of work has been done about this domain, about creating deliberate confusion um, and about kind of ignorance confusion. So um, there's confusion that comes when we don't know what's happening. And there's confusion that comes because we've created it in a deliberate way to break up our thinking. And that's actually a good strategy when we're working with complexity. I won't say much more about that. There's lots more you can read about that. but. Um, but if you uh, Google the term aporia, uh, it's a beautiful Greek term. It means basically like, um, you know, not knowing what to do, essentially. All right. So let me go around and explain these domains then. So in the current iteration of the Kinevan framework, you'll, those of you that know the framework will know that this particular domain here in the lower right has changed names several times. Uh, started out as obvious and then it became simple and it's now clear. Um, the, the domain is organized now around these five C's. So confusion in the middle used to be unordered or disordered in the middle. It's now called confusion. And on the lower right, we talk about clear. And clear things are things that have a clear cause and effect. Cause to effect. You can see what it is. Um, stuff like this that happens in the real world is things like returning emails. So that phone call that you're not making, whoever put that in there is a good example of a clear thing. Make the phone call, right? There's just like no way you can hope for an emergent situation in which the phone calls will magically be made 
you need to pick up the phone and dial the numbers. Um, dialing the numbers. Younger people than me will not know what that word dialing means. Um, so clearing, uh, clear things are like returning emails, paying contractors. And the thing about the clear domain is if you don't do them, you will end up in a catastrophic place. This is a really easy way to cross this boundary into, you'll see the chaos domain lives over here. If you don't, if you don't return emails and you don't pay your contractors, things are going to unravel pretty quickly. And falling into chaos by not doing the clear things is a terrible uh, waste of your time and energy because trying to get back to a situation where all you have to do is return an email or all you have to do is pay your contractors, trying to get back there is really energy intensive. So there are ways that we can get into, conf into chaos and that is like by moving around this diagram, going from clear into chaos is, that's a catastrophic failure and that's gonna cost you a lot of time and energy to try and recover the system. So this boundary is often drawn as a cliff or conceive of it as a cliff. If you fall off that cliff because you're not doing the clear things, you're in big trouble. Examples of, um, examples of clear uh, things, so I've talked about the examples, but what happens here is that um, the cause and effect in a clear domain is, is, is obvious. So if I turn off, if the water's running and I turn the tap, you know, it stops running, there, I've solved my problem. That's an obvious solution. Um, typically it's something anybody can do. So you can teach a child how to turn a tap off and then for the rest of their life, They'll, they'll turn a tap off except during the years of 13 to 18 when they will leave the tap running for some inexplicable reason. Uh, but soon enough, they'll recover the ability to turn it off again. As, as the parent of adults, I can tell you that all of this goes away. Um, in the evaluation methods you use to see whether or not the tap has been turned off are pretty obvious. It's pretty binary, like either it worked or it didn't work, right? Like the water running or it's not running. Um, and so you, you can apply best practices here. Right, so the turning off of a tap is really easy, um, and you can you you know, harvest knowledge from that. It's like here's how you turn a tap off. Um, of course, there are examples where we nowadays wave our hands underneath uh, things. And I was once with a, a younger person I was working with. We were washing our hands in a washroom, and and he was furiously waving his hand underneath the uh, the tap to try and get the water to come out. And I reached over and I turned the tap on. And he looked at me and he went, oh, analog, <laughs> which I thought was really, really good. But once I taught him how to use an analog faucet, of course, he could use it from then on. So best practices. So this is how you work in the clear domain. All good so far? Pretty straightforward, right? So best practices live here. And now you can wave goodbye to best practices because everything from here on out is much more context-based. It's much more... Um, much more tricky, much trickier. Okay, so the next domain, as we become, we go move more into the unordered world, and you can see that there's like a, I sometimes think of this as a spiral. You can, you can also represent Kinevin as a spectrum, like the one I, I showed you at the beginning. But this is the world of complicated things. So there's multiple causes and multiple effects. And, um, you know, there may be, you know, this is another way of saying there may be one, more than one way of doing things. Okay, so teasing across, teasing out the causes and the effects is possible, but it usually requires some expertise and a little bit of know-how. Um, so examples here typically from the world that I work in is, you know, building facilities, accounting, IT support, basically things that you need people with initials after their name to do for you, right? So an engineer, a, a professional accountant, so, you, know, soft, you know, software engineer, or IT systems architect, or somebody like this, you often get initials after your name for being really good in this domain. And, and because um, of the places where most of us work, I think you will recognize that this is a form of knowledge and a set of problems that's really highly privileged in our work. These are uh, solvable problems that they require expertise, uh, and you can charge a lot of money for doing this kind of thing. So, um, and you should, you know, you should, like, I actually want an engineer looking after buildings. I don't want a committee of uh, my musician friends who I love and who I make beautiful art with. Uh, we're, we're not the best people to maintain buildings. Uh, you probably don't want to be in a building that's been routinely maintained by uh, jazz musicians. You might, but it's an adventure. 
So complicated problems are things um, where the cause and the effect, again, they're knowable and they're predictable. So we can understand how to do things. Um, so if I go with the tap example, uh, if I turn the tap uh, on the faucet and the water keeps coming, right? Oh, how do I stop the water from keeping coming? How many of you know what to do next? Just give me a wave if you know what to do next. If turning your faucet doesn't work. Larry, John. Okay, a few of you. Okay, Amanda, awesome. Right, Mike, good. Um, and so if you do, then you have another option, right? You go underneath the sink and there's a little shut off valve, right? Word to the wise. Now you all know the next step. If that doesn't work, you got to find where your water main tap is. In my, in my basement, I have a huge sign that says water main with a big arrow to that shut off valve because once you have had a situation where you don't know where that valve is, you never want to forget where that valve is. <laughs> Trust me. So, um, so that's really helpful to have. If you don't know any of that stuff, it's going to cost you, at least around here, about $800 or so, right? To phone somebody to show you where these shutoff valves are. That person's called a plumber. That's how they make their living. So they solve the, for them, things are obvious. For me, it's really complicated. So getting an expert to help me to do it is actually a really good strategy. Right? And if you look at the number twos on your list, you should have be able to identify an expert that can help you with that, right? those number twos. These aren't things you necessarily can do on your own, but they are things you can learn, and a little bit of technical knowledge goes a long way. When we're working in this domain, our evaluation of what we've done is actually what we call summative. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the evaluation world will recognize the term summative evaluation. What that means is that we can measure our results against our expectations. So what happened? What did we say was gonna happen? So you're basically measuring your ability to have predicted the success of an intervention. Most evaluation, certainly in the world I work in, which is primarily the nonprofit world um, and the you know sort of NGO world, a lot of funders like to have summative evaluation reports. We gave you $80,000. Did you reduce literacy, illiteracy by 17%? Um, you know, turns out you can't actually measure that, but that's actually what they want. So we privilege, this is what I mean by privileging this domain of knowledge. We think there are, we think, we, we like to believe that a complex problem can be merely complicated and solvable. It would be nice if racism was solvable, right? At the end of the day, we just had like a linear predictive set of steps to solve it, but it's actually a changing and emerging situation and something we need to continually continue learning about because context change change, and so also then the, the nature of the problem changes. But evaluation that assumes that we should have known what we were doing at the beginning um, and that evaluates our performance at the end can be very helpful if we're building airplanes, if we're you know building cars, fixing a plumbing problem. At the end of the day, you should you know, plumber came in, hey, I know exactly what the problem is. I'll charge you $800 an hour. Uh, look, it only took me five minutes. So, you know, I'll just charge you, uh, you know, like a 12th of that. So you can, you, can, you can judge the results against the goals. And so here in this domain, good practices apply because depending on the resources you have, the time, the people, the material, you can solve a problem, but um, different solutions will be available to different people. And, you know, one might be as good as the other. And that's just fine. So there's not one way of doing things. There's certainly not one way to build a car. There's not one way to build an airplane. Um, a more simple problem around fixing plumbing, there may be only one way to do that. But for more complicated things, as you move across this domain, you get more and more complicated um, and more and more unordered. So problems that might be located here on this boundary are gonna be very different from problems that might be located here on this boundary. So you can already see there's some topography to the Kinevin framework, and I actually love this. I love that there's some texture to it. This boundary between clear and complicated is very porous, right? You can actually, the more you learn about a situation, the more you can sort of draw this boundary here, right? So the more technical you get, accounting problems are actually quite obvious for my accountant, but that's why I pay my accountant. You know, because she 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 doesn't spend months and months trying to figure out how to balance my books. Um, you know, I pay her to do that. Uh, she can do it efficiently and, and quickly. OK, so good. So far, so good. We love the ordered world. This is how we divide the ordered world up in Kinevin. Before I talk about complexity, I want to talk about chaos. All right. So the unordered domain, this is the this is, you know, down here somewhere is the pit of despair, like when we just don't know what's happening, what's going on. So in the chaotic world, 
ontologically, in other words, these kinds of cause effect things are all about the sort of nature of the reality of these problems. Ontologically, cause and effect, it doesn't, you know, we can't really discern it and it doesn't make much sense for us to anyway, because um, in chaos, you don't really have time to figure out a causal analysis. You're just reacting. Now, there are, there's ontological chaos, like a flood or a fire or a riot. Um, we've been consumed with four forest fires here where people, you know, people I know have had, had seven minutes to leave their homes before their entire towns burned down, right? Which is a situation we went through in June here in the town of Lytton in British Columbia. Like when you've got seven minutes to pack everything up and leave, right? And hope to outrun a forest fire that's moving that fast, you know, you're not going to sit down and go, okay, let's do a root cause analysis of what's going on. It's just like, get the hell out actually is what the strategy is. Okay, the cause and effect for all intents and purposes don't matter. It's not to say there aren't causes and effects. That's for later. But the moment of being in chaos is that, and ontologically that creates an, a situation for us. Now, this can also be a phenomenological experience of chaos. And um, I don't know where you folks work, but I do a lot of work where I'm required to uh, work with trauma-informed practices. So I'm working a lot in marginalized communities, a lot with vulnerable populations. And you can often create situations where people get thrown into chaos because you're triggering a trauma response, right? So for example, if we're trying to do some strategic planning and instead of like producing a linear, predictable, easy set of solutions for folks, we're actually saying, hey, we need to discuss this. We need to describe this. We need to explore this a little bit more. Just that lack of order can be triggering to folks. And you may have seen this in situations where people start, you know, freaking out. You can't understand what the problem is. That's a simple process. But for them, losing a sense of stability or losing a sense of order can be very triggering. And, and from a trauma-informed practice, we have to be very careful about the amount of chaos, the amount of openness, the amount of unordered situations that we introduce people into and create good systems for holding people in that so that they can be resilient moving through it. Um, and that's, you know, for me, the essence of what trauma-informed practice is. So you can have an experience of chaos, even though all around you, people are not experiencing chaos. And have any of you had panic attacks before? I'll admit, I'm going to admit to being, I, I'm, I'm okay if I'm the only one in the room. But what it feels like to have a panic attack is just to lose your mind. Like, it's, you know, your body takes over, you're flooded with cortisol and adrenaline, and you're just experiencing the world coming apart. And it can be very difficult to look somebody, to have somebody look you in the eye and go, hey, it's not that bad. Like that actually just spins you into a worse and worse place. So chaos can be an experiential thing as well as an ontological thing. And examples of systemic kind of chaos that I work in um, over the last number of years, I've worked around overdose deaths. Um, here in Canada, we have a, a massive problem with fentanyl overdoses. We have about 15 people a day dying in the country from fentanyl overdoses and four, almost a third of those are in the Vancouver area. So three or four people dying a day now from fentanyl overdoses and poison drug supplies. Um, situations where there's violence. I do a lot of work with child protection social workers who are dealing with situations where they have to react right away to the threat on a child. Um, abuse and trauma, community crisis. So these are all examples of chaos where we work and so it requires a very important response here. So in chaos, the cause and the effect are unpredictable and it appears random. So again, you just don't know what's going on and stuff is coming at you all the time. If you've been in riots, if you've been in combat, if you're a first responder, you'll recognize this. Um, and so our response to this is to train ourselves in this. So frontline workers will train themselves in firefighting or train themselves in first aid but never assume that the situation they're on their way to will be the same as every situation they've always been involved in. So you train in it with a small group of people, very clear roles. You wanna make everything as simple as possible. Um, so for example, if you go to a fire station, I don't know where it is where you are, but uh, a fire hall, you will see the fire truck parked in the garage and oftentimes you'll see people's pants light up, lined up in front of the truck. And, um, you know, my brother used to love going to the fire station as a kid, like, so every every year we'd go off to the fire station. And the funniest thing in the world is go, walking into a fire hall and seeing this amazing truck and then pants on the floor. Why are there pants on the floor? Well, there are pants on the floor because if you're on your way to a fire, the last thing you want to do is expend any cognitive bandwidth looking for your pants. 
So you put your pants next to the truck, so you have to cross that threshold, put your pants on and get on the truck, right? And these are specialized pants, right? These are suits that protect you from fire and so on. Put them by the truck, you're not gonna be able to get on the truck unless you're wearing your pants. You don't wanna show up to a fire with no pants. So doing the simple things is the way you prepare to work in chaos, but being in chaos means that, you know, that means that you're then, you can then rely on people's roles. You can then rely on the equipment that you have. Um, you've made everything as simple as possible so you can devote maximum bandwidth to what's going on. And that's how first responders train for the rest of us when we're in a crisis. You know, it's all out the window. It's panic attacks. It's we're flooded by hormones and flooded by chemicals and we don't know what to do. Um, the evaluation that happens in chaos is quite interesting. Um, there's really tight feedback loops, right? We don't sort of like have researchers sitting there like judging us on our performance. You're making your, you're acting all the time and you're sensing, you can see act, sense, respond. You're acting all the time, you're sensing the efficacy of what you're doing, and then you're adjusting and responding at a very, very quick level, rapid level of, uh, of activity. Um, the other thing that happens in the evaluation of chaotic world is if you've ever been a first responder or you've been in combat or you've, you know, you've been an ER doctor or nurse or whatever, is that you spend a lot of time telling stories. You spend a lot of time going out. This is why pubs exist, is to process chaos, right? You spend a lot of time in the, and why legions, frankly, exist, actually, um, in, in, in the Commonwealth countries anyway, and maybe where you are, there are legions as well. But these are places where soldiers, retired soldiers spend time together. Uh, military folks spend time together and a lot of the stories that get told there are helping to process the grief and the trauma of being in combat. So to be able to share a drink together, to be able to tell stories and talk about what's gone on, um, this is very common amongst trained crews and this is the way that you build wisdom. There's a kind of mentoring that happens in this space here. So it's a form of evaluation that's very important uh, and very important in human culture. Um, and so because in chaos, novel practices apply, the more stories you can have, the smarter and the more wise you become in a way. But the biggest wisdom of, of, of uh, any frontline responders I've ever dealt with is to understand that uh, your plan will always break down. So you're most often governed in this world by, you know, very simple principles, right? Like stay together, move away from the heat. Um, you know, stop, drop, and roll. If you catch on fire, you might have heard things like this. These are very simple heuristics that when your plan breaks down, you know what to do, and it helps you to be able to act. Okay, chaos. The whole world that we can talk about there. And so finally, the last set, so this is the domain, this is like the big domain we all work in, so this is complexity, and you can see that in complexity, we have a very different relationship between causes and effects. It's kind of hard to to draw it, but um, basically a complex system is a bounded system, right? So there's boundaries between this system and something else. And within the complex system, there's a set of uh, causes, there's stuff going on, and you can often see that it's often organized around particular attractors, right? There's maybe a shared purpose or there's something going on in there. Um, but what happens is that the effect, the visible effect of the system is a result of the causes all interacting in a way that produces something that is literally bigger than the sum of its parts. And this is what we refer to as emergence. And this is the dynamic that distinguishes complexity from all of the other domains, is that, of course, in chaos, the you know, emergence is arising and decaying all the time. But in complexity, emergence can arise and become very stable. Okay, so look at, think about the rise of populism across the globe, right? Like, where did that come from in its latest iteration? And why is it so pervasive? And why is it so difficult to get rid of, right? It seems like we should just be able to argue our way into some more sensible nuance about public policy and so on, but that's not how it works. Populism is a very stable political structure across the world. It's emergent, it's being held there. I don't know if it's being held there deliberately. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Many conspiracy theorists will look for simple causes and effects. Well, there's four people behind it and that's what's all going on. But if that was the case, you know, the solution would be fairly simple, although a little brutal. But the, um, but the fact is that populism is the result of many different causes all interacting and expressing itself in different ways. And not only that, but populism is just one of these E's. All right, there are many other E's that are uh, associated with the current political state of our world in the moment as well. Um, so forms of um, anti-state violence, for example, or forms of pro-state violence are also emergent responses to political challenges at the time. 
So complexity, that's what makes complexity complexity, is that there are these emergent phenomena and we don't necessarily know where they've come from. Um, I'll say something, I don't know how com com um, controversial it will be with you, but uh, there's kind of no root causes here. Like every root cause has a root cause. So what we're looking at in a complex world is a whole set of patterns that have emerged and that are stabilized, some of which can be great and others of which are like uh, patterns we need to address. And so systems like this include, you know, the obvious, I think, poverty reduction, public health. And, I mean, I don't know if you've been on the planet the whole time in the last 20 months, but we've had this kind of emergent complex crisis that's been going on. And, COVID, you know, it, it's kind of never been easier to talk about complexity since COVID has thrown us all into this. But uh, community safety, even at the level of working in a team culture change, all right, is another example of, of something that's complex and, and emergent. Um, poor dynamics in a team are not inevitable, right? They're emergent and they come from a different, a whole set of different competing causes. So the way we work in complexity um, is not get too worried about cause and effect because we don't know if our interventions are going to work. We're, don't forget we're in the, in the frame of unpredictability, but we will be able to know retrospectively if things have worked. So what we do is we assemble a group of people with multiple different perspectives and we get us all to tell some stories about the situation to share some fine-grained data the the exercise we did right at the very beginning is an exercise i do at lots of different scales we sometimes do a narrative capture of hundreds of stories about a situation so we can look and see where patterns are um, i use different forms of software for doing this dave uses SenseMaker. Um, I use um, uh, Narrowfirma primarily, which is an open source platform developed by Cynthia Kurtz, who worked with Dave on SenseMaker back in the day. But there's different ways that you can work with these um, software that gathers stories and disaggregates pieces of data. So you can see that, oh, look, like 15% of people are really satisfied with this situation. Let's look at their stories and see if we can discern patterns from this. So groups help us to do this. Diversity is critical in complexity because if you're in a complex system, you need multiple perspectives on it. Those multiple perspectives will give you a more full picture, fuller picture of what you're seeing, but they're also going to provide a fuller set of resources for being able to address those issues, All right? And because there isn't one way to fix a complex problem, you need multiple ways of, of working. And so diversity is critical here, All right? A complex system fails if it's not diverse, if it's not heterogeneous. Um, and the reason for that is that you just end up becoming, you know, infected with what's called inattentional blindness. You're not able to see patterns outside of your, um, your experience. And as a result, you end up making a lot of assumptions about the, uh, the situation at hand. So get groups of people together, the more diverse, the better. Diverse life experiences, uh, diverse perspectives. Conflict in the room is a good thing in complexity, right? We want conflicting ideas about what's going on, and we also want conflicting ideas about what to do. Because the way we solve things in complexity is if we have a conflict, if one person says, oh, we should do this, or we should do this, is what we do is instead of trying to resolve it at the level of who's right or wrong, because that's impossible to know, we actually engage in what Dave has called probes. So probe, sense, respond is the answer here. So let's try those two things. Let's run parallel experiments see what happens, and that gives us a little bit of data. And we call these safe to fail experiments. So we just try and do like the smallest possible uh, journey around a probe over a week or two, a few days even, and just see if that returns data that helps us get a sense that this might be the right direction, and then compare those things. So conflict in complexity, conflict around what we should do, where we should go, even what the nature of our problem is, is actually super useful. If you've got diversity of opinion and conflict in the room, you're actually in a good spot, all right? And you don't need to resolve it. That's the other thing. So Dave will always caution you to avoid premature convergence and especially avoid applying the CEO's preferred solution, right? That's the way you're just gonna get yourself in lots of trouble. Like the hippo, you know the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion, that's the acronym, right? Avoid the hippo. Hippos are dangerous. If you've ever been on a river in, in Southern Africa, you will know that you know, avoid the hippo is a good heuristic. So, um, so, keep, so the evaluation that we do here is, is not summative, it's developmental. So we need to actually be rigorous about the experiments that we're trying. We need to gather data in real time. We need to do a lot of feedback. And we used, need to rely on anecdotes and narratives 
and how people make meaning of the situation. There could be some quantitative objective data that comes along with that, but don't uh, discount the people's meaning and experience that they that they tell. We understand complex situations through the stories we tell. All right, I can't get my book done, and that means that I'm a failure as an author. Right, so the bigger problem isn't that you can't get your book done. The bigger problem is that the layers of meaning you've put upon that. Right, and so when we're working with, and my partner does a lot of coaching around this inquiry-based coaching, when she's working with people like that, she's not finding ways that the person can write a book. It's like, well, why don't you just sit down at your computer and finish writing the damn book? That's not the problem, right? The problem is that I associate my procrastination with being a failure, and I get into that in that feedback loop. And so it's about like beginning to disrupt that. How we make meaning of our situations is critical in complexity. It's more influential almost than the ontology of the situation, right? Try telling a teenager to do their homework. It should be that simple. Can I just can I just yell at somebody and get something done? It's one form of management. It's 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 an empty carb version of management. Okay, so. Um, yeah, and so what we're looking for here is emergent practices. If we're trying to trying to address emergent problems by definition, we're not going to be able to address them based on what we know, right? So we're surprised by something. It's like you're surprised by it because everything you knew wasn't able to get a handle on this and you didn't see it coming. So whatever you do, don't apply best practices and complexity. In fact, mistrust them highly. And you're really trying to look for emergent practices to meet with emergent challenges. And so good group work, good participatory stuff is, is, you know, ways of doing this. So all the stuff that, you know, all Mark's work, let me bring Mark McGurko back into this, but hosting leadership, excellent. Creating containers, dialogic organizational development, creating containers where we're making sense of things together, where we're trying stuff out and we're operating without full knowledge of the system. That's just the way it's going to be. We don't have the luxury of mapping the entire system one to one scale. Um, there's just a famous... You know, if you know the comedian uh, Stephen Wright, but just a really famous one-liner where he said, yeah, I got a one-to-one -one scale map of the city and it's really hard to fold. <laughs> you know? It's like you're never going to understand the whole system. And that, friends, is the Kinevin framework right there in uh, a mere 40 minutes. So what we have here is we have um, five different domains. You're always starting in confusion. Uh, otherwise, you're not, pulling the framework. <laughs> you're not pulling the framework out. If you know what to do, you're probably out there doing it. But if you don't know what to do and you're sitting down, confusion is where you're beginning. Don't know what to do. Um, map, map as much as you can about the situation. In other words, think about where you're at, write down some of the characteristics of it, begin to divide those into these domains, and then you've got these. This is why we talk about Kinevin as a decision-making domain. Then you've got a clue about things you need to do. If it's clear, the number one's on your list. Sense, categorize, respond. What are the different ways you could do this? What's the best practice? Just do it, right? I mean, the, the starting to write your book does involve turning on the computer. If the computer is not on, all right, there's an obvious thing to do. Um, or, you know, make sure there's ink in your pen. Um, there's only one way to do that. Get ink in your pen. There's only one way to turn the computer on. Um, on the complicated domain, if you think the answer is knowable, so in other words, my software doesn't work, right? Then just get your IT person to fix your software. If that's the problem with writing your book, then there's an IT person that can help you. Um, and so hire them, and that's gonna, it's always gonna cost you money to live here. Um, so you know, put, a, put aside some of your budget for complicated solutions. <laughs> this is expensive. If it's complex, right, then you might wanna sit with a bunch of other people. In fact, there's four of you here that are writing books. I would suggest taking note of their names and having a Zoom call in the next few days. You might be able to help each other, right? That's the obvious solution for me, is put them in a group and see if they can support one another. You know, there's four people writing books, including a PhD thesis. That looks like a small group to me. Uh, you all share a culture of being interested in solutions focused in complexity. I think you'll be fine. Get together and become a support group. Support groups are very helpful ways of dealing with complex challenges around behavior, around changing my behavior, whether it's around addictions or around you know trying to, to do something differently. Working with others is always more fun and more interesting, and it will expose you to lots of different ideas. And you can try them by probing, sensing, responding. Did that work? It's like I turned my computer on, but I just can't get, well, why don't you try writing like one sentence? You know, morning pages, you know, all of these different strategies that we've all tried before. They might not work for you. They might have worked for me at some level of efficacy. I'm always interested to hear and to try things out. 
um, but knowing that that's not going to be the solution, right? So don't prescribe a writing diet to somebody who's trying to write a book because it might not work for them. And there's a lot else going on in their life that might make, you know, getting up at five in the morning and writing a thousand pages, a thousand words every day, a difficult proposition. Well, it worked for me. It's like, well, it's not going to work. Well, that's how you write a book, right? Um, ooh, nice. Yeah, and chaos is when all of a sudden, like a lipstick smear appears across your framework. So if you're in a chaotic situation, the thing you need to do is act, and then you can make sense of it later. So you'll notice that the action, the qualities of action on the unordered side typically is like, just get to work, and then you can evaluate it later, make sense of it. On the ordered side, it's like, slow down, make sense of what's going on, and then act. Okay, and that's the different difference between these two kinds of problems. The last thing I'll say here is that this division between complicated and complex, this line here is critical. If we confuse these two domains, we can create human systems that are psychotic. Um, one solution to homelessness, for example, is quite simple. You just ship all the homeless people to another city, which sounds kind of funny, except that's often a strategy that's used. We just move everybody along, and then we've reduced homelessness to zero. We haven't solved homelessness, but we've kind of come up with, you know, a sort of final solution. So looking for final solutions to things, human systems, you know, and I use the term advisedly and with the knowledge of its weight, um, looking for ways of actually solving problems of culture and human systems is super, super dangerous. And it can create systems that hate human beings. So if you love human beings, get good at working in complexity and don't feel like we can engineer a solution to homelessness or addiction, because I'm telling you, I've seen some of those proposals and they're brutal right? They're brutal on human beings. They'll solve the problem, right? But they're immoral. So watch out for that line. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think we're going to, what we're going to do is throw you into some small groups because I've just downloaded a lot of stuff onto you. And for you to really have a chance to think about, um, you know, kind of how this affects your work. What does this mean for how you do your work? Um, you know, SF and Kinevin are both really human-based systems to make sure the person and the team or the individual are, are at the center of the process. And from the narratives and the perception, a lot of it feeds forward. Um, we spend a great deal of time talking about where solution focus fits potentially. And is it more in the complex? Is it more in the, the aporetic and the confusion piece? Is there other ways and how to make sure the person still is the center of that with their narratives and their perceptions? Um, and then, um, you know, a good thing in you know, McCarrigal's latest book and a big kind of framework to talk to is, um, you know, coherence. So mm -hmm. seeing um, are the narratives and the response, are they coherent to the data and coherent to your life experience? Mm -hmm. So we, that was nice for us to talk about those pieces for a while. Yeah, coherence is great. Coherence is really helpful. It, it just be, it's one of the ways in which we, you know, in a very simple way, try and find out, like, how are things similar? How are things different? You know? I, I, and, and, and difference too is a huge part of solution focus language, right? Will it be different? How is it different? Will we notice is different? Walk me through the differences, go through the details of difference. Um, coherence is a huge part of what we do. Yeah. And if you don't find differences in complexity, don't act. <laughs> like if you're not seeing differences in opinion or differences in approaches, it's like slow down. Right. So if, 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 if all right, if all the experts agree. Yeah. Yeah, Something's in, wrong. Compl in complexity. If all the experts agree in complicated, choose the cheapest one. I was wondering about the link from your first exercise about being stuck and how does knowing Kinevin now help to get unstuck? Mm -hmm. uh, is knowing Kinevin enough? Is having a diverse group of experts enough or what would be the heuristics? Um, I would, I, I think, uh, I don't think you need Kinevin to get unstuck. Turns out people have been solving problems without Kinevin for a long, long time. So I don't think that's an essential characteristic, but I would say that having a group of people is probably an essential characteristic. Um, so the, the heuristic would be never work alone hmm. in complexity. Uh, and that's one that I keep uh, really attentive to. You can never have too much diversity, right? So I'm, I'm constantly looking for diversity. And you'll, you'll, I mean, Dave Snowden, I think it's the most popular method he ever invented was a method called ritual descent where uh, as people are creating proposals and little probes for moving forward, you actually submit those to a ritual takedown exercise, um, which, which can be very brutal if you don't do it in a ritual way, right? So creating a little ritual around critique 
is helpful because it depersonalizes it, but it provides the opportunity for difference and 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 the difference of opinion and outside ideas to come in to test things. Um, mm. So always creating the conditions for more difference is really important. And of course, with a diverse, more diverse group of people, you can do that more naturally, mm. um, which is helpful. No, wow. thanks. But you don't need to know Kinevin to do that, right? You just you don't need to know Kinevin to do this work. In fact, it's probably best that you don't share this with people, <laughs> because the last thing you want to do is evangelize people to something that's really cool, instead of having them actually sit down in a group and go, "Hey, what's going on, folks? And what do you want to try doing about it?" So you know, I would always say like, let this work inform your practice. But you know, I'm probably I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know. Um, pay attention to what your client needs. <laughs> Not what you want to do. <laughs> I'd like to ask you something. Mm. Uh, okay, so w when you explain this, this uh, class, this sorting, this classification, uh, it was very clear for me that when I train teachers, they they try they they hire me like to tell them something complicated to make it clear, but then when they explain cases that happen in the in their classes, uh, of course they are complex cases. Yeah. So it's kind of difficult. I mean, so that, that that was clear for me. And I'm not sure if you have any suggestions about how to work with that. Uh, I, I, I know it's really big. It's like an encyclopedia, but I don't know what comes up. For yeah, you. well, I mean, for me, I think it's like, I would start noticing, you know, as a consultant or as a trainer, as a teacher, you have a kind of privileged view. You can see patterns, right? Because you're working with lots of different kinds of people. Um, and for me, I like to get those people together um, just to talk to us. It. Like you, you, and you. It's like what I did with the book exercise here. It's like you, you, and you are all working on a book. Um, the best thing I can do is convene you and get out of the way or maybe just be a witness. <laughs> maybe I'll learn something as well. But I think it's like when you can start to see patterns, you can start to see who needs to be connected around those patterns. Because I think I bet you a lot of the teachers that you work with feel like they're alone or the situations that they're confronting are unique because it might have only happened to them once and they have no idea whether or not it happens elsewhere. And this is why teachers and doctors uh, have lounges where they spend time. So in schools, you know, teachers lounges are very important. I remember one school that was talking about getting rid of its teachers lounge. And it's just that's a critical failure in the, the, the craft of teaching because teaching is a craft and it requires uh, apprenticeship and apprenticeship requires spaces in which the masters can train the apprentices right with stories and and connection or where apprentices can meet together and share their struggles. And I think, you know, most of the way in which we improve ourselves in, in being complexity workers is I, I like to think of it more as a artisanal craft rather than a technical knowledge, you know, in the complicated world basically things you can learn on YouTube, right? Or get a university degree or a technical degree around. But in the complex world, we're really being artists and teachers are artists. And so artists need places in which they can interact and they need places in which they can meet people who are much more experienced than them and also on their same level. Uh, and also teachers need people they can mentor as well. So I would say that a fundamental, if I take an anthro complexity approach, look at the way in which craft organizations, crafters, artisans, organize themselves. They often have a master that they've apprenticed with and continue to. I do. I've got my own mentors. They often have a community of practice in which they can share their peer support. And they often have people they're mentoring too, because you learn a lot by teaching, of course. So find yourself in that human system and create more opportunities for that is what I would say. Thank you. And... Wonderful, Chris. Well, thank you so much. We hope to invite you again uh, to go into this in a bit more depth and higher reflections. I'm already getting some people going, yes, <laughs> this would be great. <laughs> um, yeah, great beginning of a conversation on how uh, complexity and um, for many of us, you were familiar with the model or familiar with the work of Dave Snowden. Um, there's a lot to be done here and around the narrative um, stories that we build and, and create with our clients mm -hmm. so looking forward to that thanks so much everyone nice to meet you thank you so much for the invitation uh, annie and john and go well everybody enjoy your evening in australasia and and uh, and europe and the rest of us will get on with our day here in the americas <laughs>